Larry, as a, as a parent, we know how to create urgency with our kids. As a boss, you know how to create urgency with the folks who, you know, report to you. As a CEO, founder, you know, you know how to drive an organization. You're the president of a university with, you know, roughly 1,450 students from 47 states, including DC and foreign countries. We know how to create urgency, right? There are ways to create urgency. Sometimes I wonder if the political parties are using fear tactics to create urgency for people to vote, but it's not really the end of the world. Let me explain. You know, it's, oh, you guys, if we don't get Trump back in, let me tell you what's going to happen. It's the end of the world. If we don't get Trump out, yeah, we're going to be end of the world. It's, I think there's it's so much of that from both sides. It's the end of the world tactic to create urgency to want to go out there and vote. But I know a lot of people that has created a kind of anxiety that people are losing their minds. They're thinking the end of the world is really coming to America. And so as, 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 um, as effective a strategy that may be to create urgency, I also think it's increased anxiety and panic into families at the highest level today. So it, it, to, to, to either reassure or validate the point, you, do you think there is a real, real sense of urgency of what could potentially happen to America? Or are the documents that our founders wrote that we have together in our court system, are we still going to be protected long term by that? Well, you know, every we have to save the country, the country's in trouble. Having said that, um, uh, we should be cultivating respect for our fellow citizens. And we should be cultivating reason and not force because when you start using force then you get the civil war and that's a god-awful mess uh so yeah sure and and uh we should look to compromise everywhere we can uh these uh, sweeping things that they propose to do those are not compromises and those should be resisted but they should be resisted with argument you know i i uh, issued a massive call for action at three receptions in Arkansas and Texas this week. And the call for action was, here's a list of books you should read. And then you should talk to your neighbors about them. That's the kind of thing that can get us out of this mess. So, so here's, here's the part I want you to know from my end, Larry, I'm not worried if it is a real urgent matter that we may lose the country. And I'm comfortable it being just a marketing tactic. I'm both either way. I'm just trying to see from your standpoint, which one is it more? Are we really, you're somebody that uh, is well-read. This is your world. It's like talking to a doctor. If I go have a meeting with a doctor, I'm going to ask the question from the doctor. I just had a physical. So I got my score back on triglycerides. I got my cholesterol score back. And I use that hour to ask every single possible question I can about the body that I have to see what I can get. I have you right now. You've been in this world for a while. Is it really that urgent and that scary? Or this too shall pass? Uh, well, it, it will surely pass. All human things pass away. But the way you analyze it, you know, so Aristotelian political science, the first political science, here's how it works. You think about the causes of things. Uh, in Aristotle, everything has four causes. It's made out of something that's the uh, material cause. Somebody made it, that's the efficient cause. It looks like something that's the formal cause and it seeks something or loves something. That's the final cause. The most important are the last two. In America, the final cause of America is the Declaration of Independence and its principle that we are created equal and endowed by our creator with rights. That's, that's what we love, we Americans. That's what brought you and your family to this country and 150 years before what brought my family to this country. Uh, so the formal cause what the people of America, when they act together, look like is they look like the structure of the Constitution, the, the executive branch, the Congress, and the courts. And so if you have a debate going on, and this is the third time this has happened in American history, the first is the revolution and the second is the Civil War. If you have a debate going on about the meaning of that final cause, there's a sharp difference of opinion about what equality constitutes. The equality that you came to this country for was, we're gonna start out as nobodies 
as we are likely nobody's where we are right now because it's turned into a tyranny. But here's a place where nobody's get a chance. They got to go. And so that's your equality, right? And it'll come out different according to different people. The other quality is if somebody is higher than somebody else, that has to be discrimination. And the government exists to even that out. And so that's a very fundamental debate. It can't be both those things. It's either one or the other. Yeah. Well, and then the formal, right? So this pack in the court, you know, we have created a, you know, the worst no-no in the, is a violation of the constitution and the founders was to delegate the legislative power. Uh, the first three articles, you know, the first is about the legislature and the second is about the executive and the third is about the, the judges. They all begin with the blank power shall be vested in. So the executive power in a president, the, uh, judicial power in a Supreme Court and the lower courts. Only the first one says all the legislative power. That word all only occurs there. And if you read John Locke, you'll see there's a whole chapter about the vice of, de of delegating the legislative power. Because if you do that, there can be a lot more laws. You know, the Congress of the United States makes and the president signs about 150 to 200 laws a year. And that's the number that it's made for 150 years. And why it works the same way, it's cumbersome, it takes a while. And so now they delegated that out, right? And you know, in the last year of Obama, I happen to know, they added 80,000 pages of regulations to the federal register. Few of those were made by the Congress. And then the question is, who made them? Well, you gotta look it up, right? Because there's 150 agencies or so, and by the way, there's a, there, there's been every, every little while, there's an outbreak of argument about exactly how many administrative agencies there are. And the answer is there are too many to count precisely. And, uh, and so, yeah, we're, we've built a great engine and uh, it's bigger than we are or threatening to become so. And so my point is we should be concerned about that. And we should yeah. think that through, right? It, it, it's not enough. We do need a very high level of statesmanship. The reason we got out of the Civil War is that man sitting back there over your right shoulder, right? He was nobody, you know, hardly anybody in history like him. Well, we need that standard now. We need somebody who's eloquent, who has a deep understanding, who can explain beautifully, and who's courageous. And, you know, Donald Trump is some of those things. But, you know, it would be, it's, it's almost like a miracle when you get somebody as good as that. You know, Winston Churchill was like that. He was just an awesome human being. And he changed things because of that. Uh, and he could because, and, and he did it with his mouth. You know, he just, uh, people heard what he said and it was more powerful than swords. Although it put a lot of swords into motion. Larry, why do you think men like that are hated? Well, I mean, Churchill was hated. Uh, if you read his books, the, 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 and, and I'm a Churchill guy myself as well. But why are people like that, leaders like that, hated? Well, you know, first of all, they do a lot. You know, they're consequential. And uh, the, at the biggest scale, people like that make decisions that help or harm very large numbers of people. The good ones, uh, they don't intend to harm anybody except as an act of justice if somebody's done wrong. But, you know, like, uh, uh, here's an example. Here's what happens when you're a statesman. Uh, Churchill forecast the horrors of modern war. He's a very brave soldier. He wrote three best-selling books about his war experiences before he was 26 years old. And in 1901, he forecast the dead, dreadful cost of the First World War. Only one who did. And then he tried to avoid that war. And then when they got in that war, he tried to mitigate its cost. In life, especially. He said, we're a free country. We don't send you know, a big percentage of our young men to death in a four-year period. So he had two plans. 
And one was uh, he, he started the experiments that involved that invented the tank. He's the one who thought it up. It's called tank because he was in the Admiralty. He was the head of the Navy and he got a Naval engineer to start working on it. And the code name was Waterships Tanks. He was trying to spare life. Well, then the other thing was to go around. And since the trenches went from the Alps to the sea, you sort of had to go around the, the continent. And so he went down to the Straits of the Dardanelles and tried to force them with the Navy and get through, you know, and Turkey, which was in league with Germany in that war, was in the way. Well, it didn't work. And the thing is, this effort of his to save lives ended up costing a lot of lives. And those people, you know, whose family members died, they didn't know what his motive was. If it had worked, it would have saved millions of lives. And it didn't work. And, you know, he learned a lot of lessons from that. He thought maybe, well, he, he accepted responsibility for this part. He actually didn't think up that particular way of going about this cotton-wide uh, flanking maneuver. He wanted to go north. But he adopted it. And when it meant trouble, everybody else sort of drifted away. And they left him holding the bag. Uh, and so he learned from that. What he learned was, don't take responsibility for something you don't have the authority to accomplish. So that means, by the way, that tens of thousands of people on the Gallipoli, Gallipoli Peninsula, many of them from Australia and New Zealand, died because that, that effort went wrong. And Churchill's part in it was that if he had seen that they were gonna blame him for this and he still didn't have the power to make it happen, he might have stopped it. And in the Second World War, he, he learned, he set things up very differently from that. So the point is, states, statesmen have consequences and sometimes people are harmed, whatever they do, and innocent people too. And then of course, there are the partisans on the other side, you know, I mean, uh, until uh, sometime in September 1940, but reoccurring through the war, there were leading people in the British government and the British aristocracy who were in touch with Hitler, trying to work out a peace and thought that Britain ought to, ought to side with Hitler. And then, you know, the communists in, in Britain, uh, they uh, agitated against the war. Uh, well, uh, in the beginning, because in the, in the beginning of the war, the Soviet Union was in league with Nazi Germany. And so the daily worker and the communist rags in Britain, they agitated against getting in the war. And then the minute Hitler attacked Stalin, then they wanted to get in, they were all for it, right? And so partisanship explains a lot too. And the challenge, and it's the challenge for every citizen too, is to do the work, think as hard as you can, say your prayers, try to place yourself in the right and try to place yourself in the right in a way that harms the fewest people and helps the most. And uh, so that's the spirit. And that's, you know, that spirit is strained right now in the country because it's hyper-partisan. I agree. It is hyper-partisan. You know, you said something earlier. I'm, by the way, thank you for explaining that regarding why uh, folks like Churchill are hated at the level that they are. And I know you kind of said we need a Lincoln and we need a uh, Trump has some of that, you know, where they have similar uh, methods of uh, facing opposition and power. Who is the closest thing to a Lincoln that we have right now? Are you seeing anybody outside of Trump? I'm talking about the future. Who is somebody you're looking at right now that could be a future Lincoln? Well, I have hopes for some of the young ones who, I'm an old man now, so I know a lot of people. And, uh, you know, uh, Tom Cotton, a senator, is a friend of mine. We're both from Arkansas. It means we're cousins. Um, he, uh, you know, Mike Pence is a heck of a guy. Do they have that level of talent? Well, we'll see, right? You know, I, I Tom Cotton is a personal friend of mine. I've known him a long time, long time before he got in politics. And, uh, you know, I, I believe, by the way, that Clarence Thomas is one of the greatest Americans in history. I think he's the greatest member of the court in our time. And so he, he's not, He's not a political man. 
He's a legal slash political man, but I think he has the qualities in spades. I mean, it's just awesome. So anyway, there's some greatness, but is there that level of greatness? That's kind of once in a hundred years kind of thing. I agree. I agree. I, I think that's why when sometimes people say we need a Reagan, we need a Lincoln, we need a this. I think it sometimes puts the pressure on the party because everybody's sitting there saying, well, you know, no one can compare to Reagan's humor and wit. No one can compare to, you know, what Lincoln had to do when he went against and it kind of a, 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 a sometimes scares some people off to say, well, maybe I'm not that good enough to go there. By the way, didn't Clarence Thomas, wasn't he a faculty, a faculty of uh, uh, Hillsdale? I thought he was faculty, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I just was fortunate to meet him before he became famous. And before he became famous, I, I began to think that he's one of the greatest people I'd ever seen. And then he got on the court and, you know, he's just a, he's a very magnificent man, magnanimous man. So uh, I went to see him one time and, uh, you know, I don't go to see him very often because I don't feel like I ought to take his time, but he usually chastises me for not. But I said, uh, you know, Justice, this morning, I said, I've done some work and I have to talk to you about something and I'm going to take 30 minutes and I apologize in advance. You won't like it. And he said, what do you want to talk about, Larry? And I said, I want to talk about your greatness. And he said, I don't want to talk about that. And I said, see, I told you, I'm going to read you some things that you've written and some things that John Marshall wrote and the, some things that some of your contemporaries wrote. And you will see that you are a recovery of something amazing. And I read it to him and he, he actually said, Larry, you know, you and your friends helped me learn how to do that. And I said, sir, we do not know how to do that. We are not judges. You have done that. Thank God for it. Well, I just think he's awesome and I don't mind saying so. And he doesn't like me saying so. He, he, he comes across as I've never met him. He comes across. I've watched a lot of his uh, on how he takes his approach. He seems like a very strong character type of a leader. And oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's and it's good to you, see you saying that about him.